Thank you. Thank you. It's really good to be back. Um, as a matter of fact, it's good to come here. I try to come every. I turned it off. How's that? Okay, I got two of them here. I'll try to stay near. Um, it's nice to be back, and I, I actually I really like coming here for for lunch every month. Um, and I've started to try to come as as regularly as I can. Um, I, I I do a lot of speaking, and I lectured in college for several years, and uh, I I really got over being nervous. But there's something about speaking to a room full of amateur historians that. <laughs> gives me the willies. Um, I guess I don't like to be second-guessed or made, made to appear wrong. Um, this, this particular collection of photographs, though, is, is really unique, uh, a unique historical resource. So everybody who is interested in local history uh, really ought to try to take a closer look at it at some time. This collection originated with the Indiana Limestone Corporation. Um, who over the years forgot that they had it, essentially, which is not un unheard of. And when they were reorganizing um, a couple of years ago, well, 2014, uh, they discovered uh, a, really a house full of metal file cabinets uh, that had over 25,000 photographs in it. They're eight by 10, uh, some are actually contact prints, um, but they're off of 8 by 10 negatives. Uh, they were mounted on linen, and they were labeled on the back with the name of the photographer, usually a professional photography company in whatever city the photographs were taken in, um, including Bedford and Bloomington, of course. Um, and, and they contain what we now refer to as metadata, which is lots of other detail about uh, so the name of the architect, the name of the building, the building's location. Uh, if the photographs are taken in a quarry, the quarries are, are identified. Uh, and in some cases, uh, people are, are identified. This came to my attention through the Indiana Geological Survey, which is um, a part of Indiana University's uh, geology uh, program, because the Limestone Institute in Bedford took the collection on behalf of Indiana Limestone Company and came to IGS and asked them if they would be interested in being the depository for this collection of photographs. Um, partly because they have a world famous digital library, they have the capacity to copy, store, scan, digitize, and so on, this kind of material. Um, and Indiana Limestone Company really didn't know what to do with it, or whether it was a good resource to to, to try to maintain. They took the photographs originally from around 19, the early 1900s, I don't know when the earliest photograph is, I think around 1906, through about just into the Depression years, 1930, 1929, um, intended as marketing tools. But um, like all good um, photographers, they took way too many pictures. So not only did they take pictures of the buildings when they were finished, they took pictures of the buildings when they were being built. They took pictures of the buildings when they were being packed into, into freight cars to be moved. They took pictures of how car blockers load building or load uh, railroad cars. They took pictures of employees standing on finished product. Um, so so the, I was contacted as was um, uh, Eric Sandweiss, who's the history uh, department chair at IU, and asked if we thought this collection had any value. Um, uh, and I chuckled because we were just like, wow, <laughs> look, at the, look at all these photographs. Um, and we also helped, helped them try to raise some uh, grant monies so that they could maintain and digitize these photographs and, <laughs> and make them available. And I, I'm happy to say that all of the Indiana Lo location photographs, as well as the Chicago area photographs, are now digitized in this collection. There are about 10,000 finished photos. A lot of them, of the 25,000 originals, were, were duplicates, but a little, little less than half actually were duplicates. Um, and 
and now and they're, they haven't mounted the entire collection yet, but they do have a website. I, I think one of my last slides shows you how to access it. So you can actually go and look, and there are way more photographs than I'm going to show you. Um, I have about maybe 70 or so in here. They asked me if I would put this show together to help them um, organize their thoughts about raising funds for the collection, and that's really how I got interested in it. Um, my field is historic preservation, and so it, it, it fed into my other interests, of course. And I actually own some stone quarries. My, the property I live on, there's some stone quarries on it. So I've always had this sort of residual interest in the industry, but I really didn't know uh, as much about it until uh, I saw this collection and got more curious. And then, of course, I met Clay, like everybody else, and now I know a whole lot more than I knew before. Um, so I really want, so what I, what I organized this for originally was not so much to give you a history of the industry uh, writ large, but to give you sort of a photo history of it. Because this is the, this is the industry's own picture of itself, if you will. And, and, and they've, it, I, I find it interesting that not only did they take pictures of the finished product, but they took so many pictures of themselves and their locations uh, and, and, and so we now, I'll, I'll just say, I'll speak for myself. For the first time, uh, and I've lived here for almost 40, over 40 years now, um, I really got a picture of this industry, like what it really looked like to do this work. And you know, you hear a lot of things about it. It was dirty, or it was dangerous, or so on. Well, you'll, you'll see from the images um, uh, um, you get you get an insight into the, into the way the industry operated, and and even though the technologies that were used in 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 the photographs I'm going to show you have changed, and you know automation has increased um, productive capacity. There are far fewer employees in the industry. The industry is far less productive than it was in its heyday, which is right around 1926 to the to the depression. Um, Today, we produce somewhere around 3 million cubic feet of finished stone. In 1926, they produced 16 million cubic feet of stone. So, um, you know, even though it isn't as big as it once was, it's still a very huge industry, and it makes a, a, a very uh, um, notable contribution to the architecture and culture of the world. This is us. Um, this is the what's called the Salem Belt. 340 million years ago, there was an inland sea. So close your eyes, go back 340 million years. And, um, and tr just try to imagine Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and most of Kentucky covered with an inland salt sea. Um, and all the crustaceans that were dying over the eons in order to create uh, almost a pure calcium carbonate mineral, which is what limestone is. The reason that this 40 mile long, 10 mile wide strip is producing the world's best limestone isn't that it's the only strip of its kind, it's the strip closest to the surface of its kind. So sometimes if you, if you go up to the, um, the basement level of the courthouse and go down into the basement, you'll actually standing on a limestone dome. That was an outcrop, okay? In other places, it's 10 feet below the ground. In other places, you drive a metal rod about an inch and you hit it. And in some places, it's 20 or 30 feet deep from the surface, but rarely deeper than that, which means for mining purposes, it's very, very accessible. And that's really the reason that so much mining happens here. This belt is considerably longer than this. Um, the sea was large, and so you'll find limestone in a much wider area than this. This happens to have been uplifted geologically uh, to about 700 feet, which is about the elevation of Indiana in this, in this region. And so 700 feet above sea level. So, so for us, it's just sort of like going out in the backyard um, and digging. And in fact, that's what you see when we talk about karst landscape. And I'm sure m all of you, I saw how many of you went to high school here. So you've all driven through this landscape and seen karst topography before, um, where the stone and the sinkholes and the water moving through have, um, have uh, exposed the stone for, for availability. Now, the early years of the industry, and it's probably not fair to call it an industry, by 1827, 
uh, they're mining limestone, um, mining limestone. They're picking limestone up off the ground and in the creek beds and using black powder to blow it out of exposed cliffs. And they're cutting it pretty much with chisels and saws. And it's, 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 a, it's a hand business. And um, Richard Gilbert in Steinsville sort of industrializes it, if you will, and, and forms the first quarry uh, business as we know it. And, but it's still very slow going and there is no real building market. So the market is in fence rows, uh, tombstones, uh, foundations for buildings. And if you can imagine hand cutting enough foundation stone for a good size house, you know, you know how industrial you would have to be. It was slow going, everything was moved by ox cart or mule cart. Um, and so it isn't really, I don't think by today's standards, fair to talk about it as an industry, but that is how it got its start. And it was in Steinsville, Indiana, where it started. Um, by the 1850s, we have railroads. And I have to say that the railroads transform the industry in two ways. For one thing, they enable tra the transport of the goods, both from the quarry to the mill, as well as from the mill to its destination. Um, but they also create another interesting situation, which is investment. Once the railroads begin to service the limestone industry, owners of railroads begin to think about investing in the limestone industry. And once you've got an infrastructure investment on the ground, locomotives, rail, and so on, um, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty intelligent to invest in the market you're servicing. So that actually brings funds into the industry that were not there before, and it transforms the industry from being entirely locally funded to being sort of nationally funded, um, which as you can imagine, make a lot of difference. If, if each of you put $5 in my pocket, and then I go to New York and have each of them put $5 in my pocket, think how much better off I am. This is pretty much what it looks like today as in, a, in a, uh, an integrated industry that has its, its source, the quarry itself, as well as its mill and fabricating resources in the same site. But it wasn't always like this. The railroads came to towns, right? Because that's where else they could service. So they came to Bloomington. And if you've seen Clay Stuckey's presentation on the Bloomington and Bedford mills, you know that they were all built on the railroads. And so where our, our uh, bead trail is now, um, our cultural trail going through Bloomington, which was the Monon Railroad, that's where most of those mills were centered. Over time, the railroad diversifies its capacity to reach out into the locations where stone is being taken from. I, I should mention that the stone itself was dug as close to the railroad as possible originally. But as it expands out into the countryside, the railroad follows it. And eventually, the mills tend to follow it. Um, so if you think, if you think about um, uh, this becoming a sort of integrated industry and, ha and starting to create uh, efficiencies, the, the, no the, lo the location of all of its facilities in one place um, greatly enhance its ability to market its product. Where is that? Um, I can't tell you where that is. I, it, it is on the back of the photograph, however. <laughs> um, yeah, I can walk around behind that. Um, but that gives you a pretty good idea of, let's see if I, my pointer. Um, here's the slough where, where they, the water comes out of the mills uh, that is used to, to cool the saws and so on, and then evaporates, and they, they get piles of limestone dust, which... In some, in some instances was then taken to agricultural fields. Uh, here's the sort of uh, land dump for extra dirt and so on. And obviously the quarry holes that are in operation, as well as the stacking yards where material is collected and kept. And then a series of mills. One of these is an office, I'm sure. And there's usually a blacksmith shop uh, and repair shops and all the things that would be necessary. And there's often a, um, uh, a power generating uh, uh, building as well. This is the um, the breaking away vision, if you will. This is this is what most of us see when we see old quarries, um, and this this is this is uh, from the first quarry. And I'm showing it because even though there hasn't been any quarrying here since the 1970s, 
Um, you can see that there's still, sorry, there's still quite a bit of remnant. You can see a derrick in the background. And, and this is actually a causeway built uh, in order to carry the railroad. So tracks actually come across that causeway, uh, or did at one time, to, to get the stone out of this location. This is called hydroblasting, and this is how the overburden was taken off. I talked about how the stone wasn't very deep underground, but the solid stone was almost always covered with what was known as an overburden, and freeze-thaw would break up that overburden over the centuries. So you have a lot of loose limestone, and you have to get rid of that in order to start mining the solid rock. And by the, by the, 19th, or by the turn of the 20th century, hydroblasting was pretty commonly used. You've probably seen this, uh, versions of this being used in gold mining in the West. It was uh, one of the major causes of, of soil erosion in the West because they blasted away whole mountains with, with water. Um, here, they're just taking off the overburden, but it, it was a, a lot quicker to do that than, than doing it by hand or with a, a, a bulldozer. <coughs> And I'm going to sort of talk about the equipment and the mills and everything as we go along. These are channelers, which um, they're really, for all the things that we know about channelers and, and what this equipment was used for, there really aren't that many pictures of channelers other than the industrial photographs taken by the, the companies that sold them. But to see them in action is somewhat, uh, somewhat different. But what the channeler does is it sits on the floor of the quarry base and it... Um, with a reciprocating action, a blade on both sides, it goes along at a snail's pace and basically chops grooves into the, into the surface. It doesn't really sawing in the normal sense of, of this. Um, it's doing it vertically like a saber saw would do it. Um, and the blades aren't particularly sharp, and, they, and they, some of them used um, uh, quartz sand as an abrasive as well. So here you see them on their own tracks uh, and they've already cut the longitudinal line, and now they're, they're going at right angles to it to cut the cross line. So these are the cuts they're making in the position they're in now, and these are the longitudinal cuts they've already made. So you can see that you get your entire block cut except for where it's attached underneath. Here's a close-up of them pulling out the keystone. Um, and I've actually seen a a film of this, a video of this, taken from a home movie camera. Um, but they, this chain is going up to the derrick. These, this is what's called a dog chain. It goes into holes in the end that are, that are punched into the end of the stone. And they, they take a full block. They usually cut it in half or thirds. And then they, they just wiggle this back and forth and drive wedges all the way around until they can get it to break loose, and they pull it out. And that's the way they open the floor. And from there, they can start to work on the horizontal. So sometimes this comes out in one piece, and sometimes it doesn't. But when it does come out, it usually comes out with a huge gush of water. Um, the other thing in, the, in these photographs that you just don't see in the marketing photographs generally are the people who are doing the work. <laughs> if you recognize anyone, let me know. Uh, I gave this to a bunch of students, and they said, they look like overall salesmen. <laughs> Everybody wore overalls. Um, and you can get a sense of what the work site looks like, the debris, you know, the dust, uh, the, the hand tools, and so on. These are steam channelers. The one, this, these are electric channelers, which don't come along until about 1885. And these are steam channelers, which were used before that, powered by coal. They are doing the same thing, um, running along this ledge, uh, cutting the final uh, lines before the ledge can be broken off. And up in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the edge of the derrick. This is actually a wooden, octagonally shaped derrick. So the earliest derricks were wood. And then they obviously had some, some measure of strength, but they weren't as, str as strong as, as the steel derricks that replaced them later. So once the steel derrick comes in, much larger pieces can be lifted and moved around. But virtually everything that goes in and out of this hole, all this equipment, the bins, uh, everything but the men themselves come in and out on that derrick. So this derrick has a certain reach. It's usually about a 65 to 90 foot boom. And 
once you have once you're working outside the reach of that derrick you have to move the derrick and there were crews that came in it would take them two or three weeks they would take them down move them put them back up and we'll see more pictures of derricks i want also notice on the left hand corner up here is some kind of power generating unit so they're, they're burning, uh, looks like they're burning coal. They're pro it's probably a small electric generation plant. In some photos, you'll see steam channelers right alongside electric channelers, where they're, make, they're making the, the transition from one to the other. What, what happens in this industry is the same as that happened in the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century all across America, which is there's a lot of invention. There's a lot of changes in the way we power equipment from, from particularly the major one being from coal to electricity, these same things happen in the, in the limestone industry. So it's, so from about, let's just say right after the Civil War up until about 1910 or, or 15, there, there's this constant innovation and constant retooling of equipment. And that has very large impacts on the industry itself, its ability to finance itself, and its ability to put its product in the market. And I'll talk in a minute about what creates the market. This is called turning a ledge. Sometimes it's called flopping. <laughs> uh, this is where, this, where the ledge stone is finally broken off um, in order for it to be cut into smaller blocks. And if you look closely, you'll see a pulley here. This cable, this set of cables are attached to the derrick. And once this stone is there, this, this slice is cut by the channeler. You can see how smooth it is. Um, and this slice, uh, once that's cut, uh, men would, could force a wedge into that, uh, into that crack there, and they could loosen it slightly. They would go to the bottom of the block on, on this floor and drill horizontal holes under the block and use what are called slips and wedges to drive them in, and that would break the bottom of the block loose. Okay? So that's the only joint that's not sawn. The top and bottom joints are not sawn. And then they would use the crane the, or derrick um, to actually pull um, or turn the ledge. These are what are called pillows. These are chunks of limestone, and they're piled up in order to break the fall of the ledge. Because if you let the ledge hit the, hit the floor that it's going to fall on all at once, it can fracture it in several directions. The pillows keep it from breaking, or usually keep it from breaking enough of the time that it, that it was working, and they still do it this way. Um, although now when they push it off, they use airbags, but, but the, the turning the, the, uh, the cut is still a pretty dramatic thing to watch. This is that dark hollow uh, quarry in Bedford, and it's a great picture because they actually went to the trouble of labeling it, uh, bragging on it, if you will, but if you'll notice, um, at the time, it was the largest operating single hole. Um, I don't have a, a specific date for this, but these are steam er, channelers in the foreground and uh, some electric channelers in the background. So I, I'm going to guess this is 1890s, 1910, something like that. Um, you get a really good vision of the size of the hole. And um, uh, 1,400 feet long, 140 feet wide, and 60 feet deep. Um, 11,760,000 cubic feet of stone and 20,000 large carloads of limestone, railroad carloads, out of one hole. So when I, when I saw this for the first time, and I'm, I'm a limestone guy, right, I went, oh my goodness. I had no idea of how many zillions of cubic feet of stone <laughs> have been mined by this industry. And when people say this industry has had a worldwide impact, you know, I start, I, I start to understand what that means when I think that one single hole, I, it, there are eight of these holes on my property, one single hole could produce this much stone. This was no small industry. This photo also shows you really well, this is the chan these, this channeler is moving this back and forth this way. These are the saw cuts that it's making. Eventually, they get so they can do a 12-foot deep saw cut. The first, the earlier ones will go four or five feet, then they go six or seven feet. Steel gets better, the machines get better, lubrication gets better, it all, it all gets better. And eventually, they get to what's 
what's known as the 12 foot ledge, which is when you see a quarry, that's usually this is a 12 foot distance right here. And they have to step out every time they uh, reach a new floor, this is the floor, they have to step out a foot, foot and a half, because the channeler can't fit flush up against the wall. All right, so they're slowly reducing the floor of the hole as they, as they go down. To go 90 feet is pretty exceptional, 60 feet is pretty typical. Some quarries run out of stone at 40 feet, 20 feet, you know. But if you think about, the way I had this explained to me was, if you think about a, a tree trunk lying on its side and all you want is the heartwood, or in the case of limestone, the very best stone available, you want to get to the center of that deposit where the best stuff is. So, so you're basically peeling away the cambial layer and the bark and the soft wood and so on until you get to the heart. And the heart is at the depth. And, and, and here, you, what you're looking at is very clear buff limestone, um, almost unblemished. The other thing you can see in this picture, actually, this is, they're about the same, but this one, this has been, this is, this is the, the ledge that's just been turned. And if you look closely, you'll see that block has been broken away. And the way they do that is they take a drill and they drill a line of holes and then they drop a wedge in there and they actually break those blocks off by hand. And the reason that they do it like that is because they get orders for certain sizes of blocks. Now a typical block is about uh, 8 to 12 feet long, uh, about 12 feet deep, tall, it would be tall, and, um, uh, and weighs about 20,000 pounds. But if, if you're going to make something and you know what it is, let's say a sculpture, and you know what size block you need, you can have it cut right as it's coming out of the quarry, okay? And that's what they do. Because if you move that block in its largest iteration all the way to the mill and then break it, you've pretty much broken your back unnecessarily. If the smaller it is, the easier it is to move. So, so you'll see, you can see it's a little bit difficult there, but in the next one, you see a, a whole series of wedges um, right there. And those men are, are driving the wedges into drilled holes and that'll be, the, that'll be the fracture line. And you can see they either broke it there themselves or it broke when it fell. Um, and you can see here, again, pillow stones, the sawn face, really, really great photographs illustrating how the, how the process worked. Again, and here you can really see the, the drill holes. And here's a block that's been taken out. And look what, there it is. That's called a dog chain. They, they take a chisel and they knock hole, they knock pockets in the end of each block. So if you see blocks laying around on the scrap piles and you see a kind of a pocket cut out of the end of it and the pocket cut out of the other end of it, that was so the dog chain could get in there and pick it up. And that's what a lot of these people did who were working down on the floor was readying each stone to go out. Now if you go to a quarry floor and watch them work, they're using big front end loaders that will come up and they, they, still, they still drill uh, and fracture in, in a similar way, but they have a whole line of hydraulic drills and the guy just sort of steers it over the rock and two people aim it and it just goes down, drills all the holes and comes back out. Uh, and then they, they use a little wedge to, to break it. Um, a much quicker, less, less intensive process. Also, you can see here, um, big piles of coal for, op for powering the, um, the steam channelers. Again, wooden derricks. And that gives you a good view of the boom arm and back here, and it, which is usually about the same size as the vertical arm, which is locked in an upright position. And they're on a wheel, so they can turn it 360 degrees. I don't have any pictures of the operators. Uh, in the earliest days, some, these were turned by mules. Later, they were turned by what was called a bull wheel, which is a very large wheel, which gave you a mechanical advantage, and a man could actually turn that wheel and, and twist the, the boom around. Okay? And then the, cha the chains and ropes, first, first ropes and then steel cables, were actually operated by hand or with the assistance of an animal. So you had a mule harnessed to this cable, and somebody would walk the mule away, and the stone would come up with lots of mechanical advantage pulleys in between. Um, eventually, they become electrified and run by turbines. 
At that point, there's a, there's a structure called a powerhouse, and there's an operator who sits in this powerhouse, and it's a series of clutches and drums and pulleys. Uh, it's about a 25 or 30 foot long unit. And he sits in there, and he's blind to the quarry. He can't see what's going on in the quarry. And there are, there are signalers who tell him by hand signals where to move those booms and when to drop the chains and so on. And um, needless to say, he was the most important guy on the job because he was the one moving, the, moving stuff around. And a mistake on his part could be a mistake on everybody's part. Um, this is the first Kerber mill in Bedford. And when I said that they were built near the rail lines, you sort of get the picture here. That's Bedford <laughs> right there. <laughs> so these were very urban, uh, at least in the first iteration. Um, and most of them had a mill where the fabricating happened. Uh, depending on their site, they would have yards and so on, like I showed you, and always an office for the marketing and uh, the executives, and frequently a smokestack where they were generating their own electricity. Why? Because they got electricity before the towns did, quite often. Um, eventually, they all go on the grid. But in the early days, they're powering their own uh, equipment. And by early days, I mean we're talking about the turn of the 20th century, pretty much, up until the Depression. Remember, we didn't electrify the Tennessee Valley until, you know, the, almost uh, World War II. So the component, this, the components of of the fabricating mill, sometimes these these are called stacking yards. Sometimes they're at the mill, and sometimes they're at they're they're at the quarry itself, and usually both, because they have to stack it up and then they transport it. They're loading these these are the rail cars. Remember the twenty thousand rail cars? Imagine those. Uh, as, imagine twenty thousand of those. They're only carrying you know four or five blocks a piece. And this is a, you know, uh, a virtual garden of derricks because they, they have to have them almost everywhere so they have access. And again, you can see the rail lines coming in. And in fact, in this one, there's a steam locomotive coming down the track. These are the pictures that helped me understand the scope of this industry. <laughs> I don't know how many acres that is, probably 10 to 15 acres almost all in stacking yard. There's a railroad, there's a rail line there, a rail line there, a rail line there, a rail line there. This is all into one operation. Mm -hmm. Several derricks, that's, that's the operating hall right there that they're taking stone out of. And then here, back here is the mill and the power generating equipment. And again, here's a stacking yard. And here's another one right along the right along one, two, three rails. And if you imagine this by by um, trying to remember how many actually in this, how many actual businesses there were at this time, I have it written in here somewhere. Well, in 1896 to 1918, 25 new mills and 38 new quarries opened in Monroe County. So that's the boom. That's the bo those are the boom years. So imagine that times 38. And the stacking yard, eventually, they, and now they, and they still use these mobile cranes um, for loading and unloading. And here's another, you, you can see how multifaceted the, the operation is at the mill. Um, and you can see all the rail deliveries coming in and out. Uh, and there was actually a building here, which was, I, th I believe it burned. This is the Burris. Uh, you, know, you know this one? Uh, this, this the Salem Mill that burned. Salem Mill. And this is a, just a schematic that I found in, in, among the photographs, uh, probably drawn by one of the engineers at Hunter Valley, showing the schematic for the rail lines into a single uh, mill, mill location. So this, you know, this gives you a pretty good idea of, of the location of, of uh, different functions, uh, the mill and so on, and then quarries, uh, outbuildings and so on, but also just the infrastructure investment in one location. 
So if you were building railroads, wouldn't you want to invest in this industry? <laughs> and this, I did this schematic um, um, at the Woolery Mills several years ago, 19, uh, let's see, 2002 maybe. Um, we put the Woolery Mill site, this 23-acre site, on the National Register of Historic Places. And the Cassidy's wanted to help develop that site. They were going to move their offices there. They wanted to do some tax credit uh, development there, um, and which, some of which they've done and some of which is still pending. Um, but in order to do the National Register nomination, we did this schematic that showed the sort of functionality um, of, of a typical mill. Here's the administration building. And this is actually locationally accurate as well. The administration building's over at one side. Uh, cooling tower for their fresh water, or for the, I'm sorry, for their cooling system. And this is where the architects and the engineers and the business people, the salespeople and so on are working. And then there's, these are prefab steel buildings. There's a blacksmith shop, a mill office, which is where the orders come from the administration building into the mill office and then on into the working mill, and then a machine shop for repairs of all their own equipment. Um, there's a overhead tramway that travels up and down, which is how they move things. Uh, there's a stockpile out here. Railroads, there were two railroad lines that came into this building and went out the back side. And then interestingly, over on this side, and this, my, my uh, red dot is going down Weimer Road, okay? This is Tap Road down here and Second Street up here. And this, if you ever notice this creek running along here, that used to be a creek, but now it's a canal that was straightened out by the quarry company in order to service their own uses for that water. And if you go slowly enough, you'll notice two or three concrete dams, some of which are in bad repair and some of which are not, and actually some pump houses made out of limestone out in the ponds. Um, and that's how they got their water out of that creek and they dammed it up, and then they had some still ponds in between, which aren't shown here. Um, and they used that water to run with their saws to cool the saw blades and the stone, and also to wash out the limestone dust effluent into their slough where they could then evaporate it and reclaim the limestone dust and sell it to farmers. Um, so that's, that's the essential business organization uh, or at least, at least the job task organization. And then, of course, all the sawing uh, and fabricating, including carving, was happening under one roof, which is you know, a 300,000 square foot roof, but it's one roof, big, a big mill. And it's, it's still there. You can, you can visit it. Um, it doesn't have any of the equipment in it anymore, but you can get a sense of the scale of the, of the industry because all these outbuildings, uh, service buildings, are still there, and so is the um, office designed by one of the Woolery brothers, by the way. And it's very interesting. If you haven't, how many people have been to that site? Yeah, good. One of the most interesting, thi oops, one of the most interesting things for the National Register nomination was that uh, when the Woolery's designed this building, the administration building, they did it in, in, in a sort of international style, which is a very modern style. Um, ironically, it was modernism that kind of killed the limestone industry at a certain point, when all the buildings start to be made out of steel and glass, who wants limestone, right? Um, the, however, they built their building out of limestone, and every facade demonstrates a different cut of the product that they were selling. So you can walk around the building and see all the different finishes that they put onto limestone. It's quite interesting, um, and, and really a lovely building. So mills just get bigger and bigger. They are indoor-outdoor spaces originally, and, and really they weren't worked in over the winter months until they started to enclose them. And this one, I think, is in the process of being enclosed. Uh, here's a really good shot of the overhead crane called a tramway. It travels on this track. It runs down both sides, and that's how all the product is moved around inside the mill. Usually there's a... Um, um, line shaft that's powered electrically or by steam that runs down one side, and then everything, all the machinery is powered off of a belt drive from that line shaft. This is kind of an oddity. This is actually a limestone kiln. The reason that limestone is called limestone is it's the stone from which you get lime. 
when you burn limestone, you get lime. And lime, for making plaster and mortar, um, has been around since time immemorial. And I don't know who discovered that when you burn limestone, you got lime, but that person you know, would, would have automatically gone into the mortar and plaster business. You know, they were burning lime in Rome, they were burning lime in China, they were burning lime in BC. Interestingly, you don't see very many lime kilns associated with this industry in this area. This is one that, that was in the area. Um, and they're taking their scrap and they're burning it and producing lime and then selling it into the market. Yeah, I, I know the cement industry makes lime, but the limestone industry, and when you go to the mills, you don't see lime kilns, which, you know, if you think about sustainability and recycling, <laughs> would have been a pretty logical business to be in. What they were doing with the waste, you know, a lot of times were just stacking it up. Um, so, but in this case, it's the small waste, at least, is being re repurposed. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the machinery. I want to I give you a picture of like what happens that makes this industry go from the hand chisel to the Industrial Revolution and become this multi-million dollar corporation. Uh, in the last quarter of the 19th century, several things happen. One of the most important is the fire that happens in Chicago and Boston around 1870, 71, 72. There are major fires. Chicago virtually burns to the ground, as does Boston. Why? Because the buildings are made out of wood. Okay? So codes start to come into effect for building, particularly in urban areas. And this is also the beginning of the time of an era that we, we know as the progressive movement. And the progressive movement was intended, ideologically at least, to service urban areas and help make them healthier places. So it was mostly health-based. There were lots of slums being identified. There were lots of new immigrants in the country. People were living on top of one another in urban uh, dwellings. It was very unsafe. It was extremely unhealthy. There was lots of cholera and so on. And so the progressive movement was, in, in essence, a way to try to uh, revolutionize the way we think about taking care of ourselves. And so it had a lot to do with promoting health. You, you get the Red Cross. You get all kinds of all kinds of clinics. You start to get um, natal clinics and so on. And in and, and that, same, that, that same era, um, architects and designers and, and, and urbanists begin to think about, well, what can we do for our cities that will improve this? And one of the things, the obvious things, was we need to get rid of these slums, and we need to make them fire safe. Okay? And we need to make the buildings safe enough that they don't deteriorate just under the wear and tear of urban conditions. One of the main agencies of urban deterioration was the burning of coal. Because when you burn coal, you get sulfur dioxide, and sulfur dioxide eats brick. Okay? So as a matter of fact, in the basement, I live in an 1830s house, and in the cellar of that house, where there used to be a coal furnace, the brick is all eroded away and just turning to dust because that, that uh, um, acid is still in the brick after all these years. So, so limestone is not sensitive to, that, to sulfur dioxide. And it would not deteriorate in, in urban blight, if you will. And so it became a very valued stone as a, as a building, as a construction stone, because of its durability in the, in, in, in the sense of its resistance to, to, to uh, coal effluent. The other thing that, that happens is in the effort to make cities more beautiful, in 1893, we have something called the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. And it's led by Daniel Burnham, who's a primary architect in Chicago. And he gathers all the architects in the United States, the, the major ones together, McKim, Meaton, White, and all these people. And they're all basically neoclassical architects. And they decide that they're going to build what, what becomes the white city in Chicago. And they build a neoclassical city, classical architecture, columns, and so on. And they build it out of plaster of Paris, and it becomes known as the White City. And it's temporary, right? They're going to just tear it down after the fair. But it becomes a model for how to beautify American cities, and it starts uh, what's known as the City Beautiful Movement. The, the mental image, and, and, and millions of people from this country go to Chicago to see this fair. It's, it's a world-famous event. 
And, and the visual image created is of this white city. What's white? Limestone is white. <laughs> so limestone becomes the key in building ingredient for the rebuilding of urban America. And almost every city has some monument to that. We have our courthouse. We have our, um, uh, um, I can't think of the next building in, on the next block, the seventh. Where, where did we go to the radio station? The Masonic, Hall. The Masonic, the Masonic Hall, Hall. And so on. There's, you know, there's a chain of limestone structures there right in the center of the city. When was the courthouse built? 1905, right the time, the time we're talking about. Go to downtown Indianapolis. You have the Soldiers and Sailors Monument. You have the War Memorial. You have a whole corridor about four blocks long to the public library of limestone buildings. Detroit has the same thing. We put the Empire State Building up in, you know, and on and on and on. Guess where that stone's coming from? Right here. So there's a huge boom in that period of time. The other thing that happens is that right at the end of World War I, 1917-18, there's an enormous urban building boom worldwide, but particularly in this country. We're still pretty much on the farm until the 20th century. And then all this stuff gets built and all the supply, most of the supplies. By 1924, I think it is, uh, Bloomington Bedford is supplying 75% of the construction stone in the United States. Okay, so it's 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 huge thing. So in the milling, so what happens in the milling process in order to re to meet this need is a lot of innovation and and a built and capacity building. They're now by 1905 or 10, they're almost all fully electrified. So so there's a lot more efficiency. Uh, it's a lot cheaper to produce. You don't have to go out and, you know, a lot of the limestone companies were investing in coal mines at a certain point. See, Now, they may still be burning coal to generate the electricity, but they're doing it off-site for the most part. So they start to, so they start to improve their machinery. This is a, what's known as a monolithic column made out of one piece of stone. And in the background, they've mocked up the rough cut, what's called the scabbled piece, to show you how that would work on a lathe. Lathes get a lot bigger and a lot faster, and the cutting tools themselves go from steel to diamond tip. And that all happens in this period of time. Here's this sort of a general picture uh, in the mill, and here's a, a better close-up of that. These are gang saws. Uh, gang saws have been used for a long time before they become uh, steam-powered and electrified, but they're basically limited to what a couple of men can do on the end of a saw. Um, now they're cutting slabs simultaneously, and if you notice, they're set up to cut several different thicknesses at once. And this bay has the saw blades attached there with these uh, pegs, and, the, and that, that thing swinging back and forth through that mill, and they're flooding water through that stone from the top, and that water's going out into the sluice from here. And, and at Woolery, they went into underground uh, freshwater sewers and went out into the, the still ponds. So these are going running all day, cutting slabs, and they're still doing it this way. These are planers, and a planer is a kind of a generic term for a tool that can actually work like a router. It can also work in combination with a lathe, um, but they're, they're essentially used for smoothing the surfaces of stone. So that's, you can see these smooth surfaces here. You run that into that machine and I'll show you some better pictures of it. And they can also be used for cut it for planing shapes into stone. So here you have a cornice from a building. This would probably be up around the top floor of the building or at the rooftop. Um, and you have cutting blades that are that are cut to the shape of the uh, of the piece that you need to cut. And then in this case, the table runs through the machine, and the machine is stationary. In some cases, the machine runs back and forth across the piece. Here's a lathe that's being used for fluting columns. And I think I have a picture, here we are, of this, again, set up on a lathe in the mill. Uh, and that lathe can turn, of course. But what's happening here is this router bit, shaped like a flute, which is that semicircular groove, uh, is actually traveling back and forth up and down this column on this table. Here's its track. And of course, and then uh, there's several variations of this. It's very inventive. I haven't really made a study of the machinery, but it, 
it would be really fascinating to see one uh, that really goes into detail. There are several catalogs from the companies that make this stuff. And, uh, uh, Clay shared one with me recently. Um, and here's a machine that you can actually change the arc, the pitch of the machine in order to, for the router. So the, the router head, the cutting head here doesn't move, but the machine rolls over from one side to the other. Again, an operator running a planer. Or here they're calling it a shaping machine. Uh, it looks like he's just drilling a hole in it, probably for attachment. So yeah, these, you know, I've looked at these so many times, they're not, they're not amazing to me anymore. But these are the first pictures I ever saw of this, of, of this stuff being done, actually operating, you know. Um, and, and, uh, and there are hundreds of them. <laughs> And here's car blocking. Car blocking is the phrase used for loading uh, rail cars with the building. So, so you've got all the blueprints. The thousands of pieces for this building have now been shaped and cut and, and finished. And they have to be loaded into a rail car. And by 1891, the primary market for limestone is New York City. So that's where a lot of it's going, right? So not only is it fairly fragile material, but you've got to load it in a way that you can get it across the Alleghenies to New York without breaking any of it and load it and unload it safely and then get it erected into the building. So the car blockers were important folks. And here you can see they're stuffing straw down between the pieces. And here's the, the tram has brought them some more pieces. Notice that they're all marked. And so, you know, I mean, I don't know how many cars like this it would take to ship the Empire State Building to New York City, but I'd say several thousand probably. So certainly several hundred. So the car blockers had really important work. You didn't want them to send the car back with a bunch of broken pieces in it. Um, here they're using straw, and here he's using limestone dust to pack the, um, to pack the car. So they're putting all those pieces in. They block them with pieces of wood. And then they fill those interstitches with uh, sometimes sawdust, sometimes limestone dust, sometimes straw, whatever was on hand that would cushion the pieces. These are segmental columns getting ready to be shipped. And you can see how they put a wood block in every flute and then cable them to hold them in place. Because as those things get moved around, they're too fragile. You'll break those, you'll break those flute columns off. And so this, that, keep, that protects the pieces. They were frequently wrapped. Um, there, you can see that one wrapped up here. Um, and then when they're loaded onto a car, uh, they make a little hut cap for it to protect it from, from debris, but also from rain and other things. Not that rain would hurt it. For, for, but, um, uh, so the, the packing and the carting is a fairly elaborate part of the business as well. Here's a slab being transported. Um, yeah, so if you've ever crated, you know, uh, your furniture in a way to keep it from breaking, you know how, t how, time's, how time uh, con consuming it is. <clears throat> also a really nice um, picture of that wooden mill behind it. And of course, everything was marketed. This is Indiana limestone salesman. Um, and I like this picture because you know where this is? West Baden. Yeah, West Baden Springs. Um, I don't know if the cooks use this picture to help recreate the interior or not, but it's a pretty good recreation of it. And then last but not least, by any means, um, the carving, which is phenomenal. I, I didn't add that in. When, when the boom years take off, the early 1900s, there isn't enough labor for this huge growing industry to service itself. They, there just aren't enough people to do the work. And, and that, is the fa that is the era in which they go to England, Hungary, Italy, um, France, um, Western Europe primarily, but not exclusively, and start looking for experienced stone workers, and not just carvers. Um, but millmen and quarry workers as well. And they also start to adapt some of our industry to, the, to techniques that have been learned in the marble industry, which is by now centuries old, in Italy uh, and in Hungary. <clears throat> and so um, 
a number of, of our best known carvers were immigrants, um, not all of them exclusively, um, but, but there's a whole new tension in the industry set up when a lot of immigrant member technical experts immigrants move into the industry and start to either take jobs or supplant other uses. And then there's, there's quite a bit of strife when the boom starts to fade at the depression about what we're gonna do with all the immigrants. <laughs> and, and I don't know, like on the census at the first quarry south of Bloomington, the census during the 1930s and 40s, uh, there are um, something like, I can't remember the exact number, 67 or 68 Italian named individuals who were on the site the day the census was taken. And, and I sort of got the idea like, well, were they living here? No, the census takers just came out and took, whoever was there got, that's how they got listed that day. And they're all listed as quarry workers, essentially. Um, and but by the time of the depression, that a lot of those people have either moved into the industry in other parts of the country, a lot go to Texas and Louisiana and other limestone areas, or they go home. And if you've ever taken the Vinegar Hill tour here on uh, East First Street, you'll see that there are a lot of big limestone homes that were built by the owners of the industry, and the smaller limestone homes as you come west were largely built by the carvers. And they're some of the most beautifully uh, attributed carvings on those buildings that we have in, uh, in Bloomington, and several in Bedford as well, of course. So this is sort of just to give an idea of the scale. Um, Several of these individuals are identified on the, on the photos. Um, the, the one on the right here is, um, you probably all remember the Steve Canyon cartoons that were in the newspaper. Well, that man on the right, right there in the jacket, is a Steve Canyon model who's been hired. And they're, they're carving a monument to Steve Canyon. I don't know where it's going to go. But this carver is doing the mock-up, and he's modeling for it. And it's interesting because it shows you the small, uh, sometimes clay modeled, uh, sc full scale, scale model uh, that the carvers work off of. Sometimes these were clay modeled and sometimes they're actually cut out of stone. Um, and then the roughing process uh, of, the, of the form. This looks like it's all cut out of one piece of stone, which is actually kind of unusual. Um, and the model and, of course, the owner and his daughter. Um, there's some Corinthian capitals on the right and some bas relief on the left. Eagles are big. Um, and again, this, this um, sort of Egyptian architecture on the right. And, and look at all the people who are working on it. <laughs> and here you can see the line shafts behind the power shafts. This one intrigues me, the one on the lower right. is It's actually a very famous photograph. I've seen it in lots of different publications. But having three people working on the same piece at the same time, all doing the same thing, and, and having them all come, come around and have it all work out, <laughs> that, that, you know, I can, you know, it's like, it's like getting two people to operate a wheelbarrow. You'll never get anywhere. But I, I love that they could do that. <coughs> And, and there, they're using pneumatic drill and some hand, hand drills. And this is a, a, um, a, a, a relief. These were relief tablets. They are uh, on the upper frieze of the Yale University Library. They're still there. Um, I think they were carved by Indiana Limestone. And that, that's one of them. And there are, I don't know, 30 of them altogether. You see several of them. And get the idea of the kind of detail. And of course, be, being from around here, you've seen these things before, and the scale of the work done right in the mill where the sawing and fabricating is taking place. I think those eagles went on Penn Station in New York. Oh, is that right? <laughs> now they're probably in the in the dump now. Then. Yep. And this is I just love this picture. This is an Italian worker and an American local worker. Harold Hadley and Harry Ray, and there was an article in a limestone daily or limestone weekly about equality for all. And this, the note at the bottom says equality for all story um, to show that everybody was getting along just fine, which I hope was true. So um, I'm about to, to wrap it up. I've got, I just, I wanted to show you what some of the finished photos look like. This is Grand Central Terminal. 
This was taken in 1914. Uh, you can see at the bottom there, uh, 2614. Um, before the clock tower, what's called the clock group sculpture, which is mount, gets mounted here, before it's put on. Okay, the building is substantially done except for the decoration. And here's a picture of it a little bit later with the clock tower, with the clock work completed. So that's, that's good. We, we see these sort of generations of building. But look here. Here's the sculpture being sculpted. Okay, that's the, there's the main figure. Which, that's the, the upper half of, or upper two-thirds of the main figure. Um, and you can get the scale from the sawhorses and so on. Here's the head of winged Mercury at Grand Central Station, ready to be hoisted into place. There's one of uh, the other gods in the, in the clock group, uh, still in the mill. Now here you can see how the blocks are put together to create these very large sculptures. All right, so here's a seam, here's a seam. You see it going on out into the, the wheat here at the leg. So these stones are stacked up on top of each other into, the, into and then roughed out, presumably by this well-dressed man. Um, I don't think he wore that to work. Um, but here you can see they've roughed out. There's that standing leg, and there's the kneel, kneeling leg um, going up to his waist. And um, you can still see the drill marks in the stone and how they've been patterned together. Uh, and the rather shaky looking uh, infrastructure around it. And then the final piece with the sculptors and the installers posing on it. I mean, isn't that just a phenomenal photograph? I don't, where's it taken from? <laughs> yeah, perfect. This guy, and here's the head, and here's that torso. Here's the lower part of the torso, the legs. Here's that other figure, I can't remember. And here's this guy sitting in his lap. And, um, and, and you know, you can see the, the, the structural components um, behind it. I mean, that, that in itself is a feat. That's 40 feet tall, 38 feet tall, and ha about almost half, half as wide, a little, little more than half as wide at the bottom. And there is the finished piece. <coughs> I have a couple of minutes, um, and I'm, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have, but I want, I'm going to really quickly show you this sequence uh, that I did for on, on these monolithic columns. Um, as equipment got better and better and the cranes were able to lift more and more material, they started to be able to make columns out of single blocks of stone. Okay, These are 30-some feet long. I'll do it, I'll do it quickly. Here, here it is being mounted into a rail car the monolithic column. These are all going to be turned columns. Here's one that's what they call scabbled. It's rough cut. They now had a machine that could do that off a lathe. And they're all scabbled, but notice that they're still out in the quarry. And here they are turned, several of them turned, and several of them waiting to be turned. And I love this picture. Just everybody went to lunch and he was left holding the column. <laughs> Yeah, where did those guys go? <laughs> yeah, it's just a great picture. Um, and the one we saw in the beginning. And there is actually a version of this that is labeled with all the names. And, and um, uh, Rural Steel, who the highway is named after that you've all ridden on, is right there in the cap, in the brown, in the, in the gray cap. He was a quarry worker before, he was, before the highway was named after him. Um, and now, and these columns went into the Harrisburg uh, Courthouse, which is in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And it's actually a series of buildings that are multi-columned neoclassical buildings. And they're all unitary columns. And this, this actually shows you how they get them in place. So there's a, a steel armature that is, that is holding the main piece, and it's linked back to another iron band, and then a, just a rope lassoed around the end of it. And here they are next to the building, and you can see the tackle hanging down. 
Notice that they've built an entire story of iron work on the top of the building, and they've put cranes, derricks, up on top of it in order to raise this material onto the building. Okay, no small feat. I'd like to have had the iron bid for that, that project. And these are the areas where the columns are going to go, these recessed facades. And here's one being raised, attached to this derrick. Okay, and it's in the armature, it's being raised. And here is another one being raised with onlookers. And they're all lined up, ready to be mounted. Here are the powers that be. We all know these guys. Um, there for the event. And here they've, got, they've actually managed to get them to go up on this facade, several stories off the ground, while this column is being set. And here are the, here are the quarry workers setting the column. And here you get a really good vision of, of, the, of the derricks and how they're actually established on the building itself. And there's the finished product. I mean, it's a miracle, isn't it? <laughs> and, and, and this was before people knew how to do anything. <laughs> before digital era, before digital cameras. Okay, that's, that's the show pretty much. I put this slide in here because the uh, Indiana University Image Collections online, there's a little narrative here about, and I pretty much told you this information about how they found the collection and how they're working to, um, to share it worldwide. Um, and if you want to look it up, that's how you look it up. Anybody have any questions? I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks very much. Yeah. I had a question. Uh, the aerial views of the quarries yeah. often showed them filled with water. And you said these are working quarries. How did they yeah. do the turning? They ran pumps. With water? While they were working, they ran pumps. And if the water was deep enough, they ran the pump 24 hours a day. And they were either pumping it over into a hole that they had just evacuated, or they were just they, they were running pumps, pumping the water out while they worked, and they were running it into, an, into a quarry they'd already worked on, or they were just running it out over the side. And um, we had some working quarries behind our property, and one, one summer they came over and said, can we have some of your water out of your quarry? And they were pumping water over into their place because they needed the water for lubricating, for, for freshening their saws. But, but yeah, so, and if, and if you go to old sites, you'll see frequently these old cast iron pumps mounted on the ledges where they were, and the big, big fiber hoses running out. Um, in, uh, in most of these places had to have a source of water to work. If they couldn't get it out of the quarry itself, they frequently dammed up a creek, would make a shallow pond, and they would build a whole irrigation system to get that hydro piping back to the site where they could then blast off the, um, you know, there's a whole other industry there of just water transport. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, Michael. I had a question with a comment. That in the HC, just a few days ago, the Herald Times, they had an article about limestone carving. You know, I don't know if you saw that. Or not. Yeah. About yeah. how what a lost art it was. And apparently, this guy had figured out the process by which they did it. Even though there's no place to look for that, he guessed it, I guess. Now he's teaching other people. Yeah. That yeah, and you, if you do the, uh, you know, Bybee Stone will do tours. They do tours often, and I used to take students there, and they always had carvers working, and, and they would, you know, let people take their pneumatic hammer and practice on a piece of stone, and they would show you how fragile it was. And, you know, the beauty of this stone is that it's, it's even though it's a sedimentary rock and it's put down in layers, and when you lay it in a building, you have to lay it the way the sediments go. It'll erode if you stand the sediment on end. But you can carve it and cut it in any direction because it's such a fine grain. And that's why it's considered the world's highest quality limestone because it, it doesn't really weather. It does weather. It doesn't weather as rapidly or, or as badly. It is sensitive to certain salts and so on. So. If you have a limestone curb, you don't want to put salt down on the street, or a lot of buildings are deteriorated because they salt the sidewalks and so on. Um, 
but it's not, it's not, it's generally, it's considered the highest quality for that because of that. Yeah. Clay. Uh, the ruins of that lime kiln that you showed are still there. Are they? Okay. And the, the thing that killed that idea of using the overburden or anything else for, for the lime was transportation costs. They found out pretty, pretty fast that other regions in the country where the lime would go, they can quarry their own stone a lot closer to those lime kilns, uh, and uh, they don't need high quality buildings. Right, it doesn't, to have burn to be, the right. it doesn't have to be that clean. Yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. So, did it, did it never really take off here? No, yeah. Certainly didn't. Yeah. And in fact, Bedford, uh, they had their own uh, cement uh, plant, short lives, <laughs> but they quarried their own stone just right there, a couple hundred yards away right. from their plant rather than using right. it. Right. Interesting. Anybody else? Uh, do you know why they call it different layers of the limestone, you know, like the Bedford limestone, the, the Mitchell limestone layers? Why they call them that? Yeah. Well, there's a there's a, a, a geologic attribution for for one. There actually there's actually, like, uh, this was told to me by Todd uh, um, Thompson. When you hear when you hear Indiana or Bedford limestone, that's a marketing name. Okay, that's just to identify the region it came from primarily. When you hear Salem limestone, that's a reference to the geologic formation, which is Mississippian era. 340 million years ago, right? So that's the, that's the geologist's way of referring to it. When you hear oolitic limestone, that's a reference to the composition. And oolits are tiny crustaceans. They're not the only crustaceans in, li in limestone, but they do make up some more than others. Um, but, but, the, but oolitic is, a, is really a term that talks about how, about the composition and grain of the stone. Um, and then, as I said earlier, the word limestone itself comes from the ability to make lime out of burning the stone. Yeah. And when you hear Mitchell stone, it's probably from Mitchell. <laughs> uh, in yeah. the code of stratigraphic nomenclature. Here we go. Here we go. Come on uh, up. One, typically, if you define a unit, a geologic mapping unit, you name it for either the first or best example on the outcrop. So that's why it's called that. Yeah. Salem was mined down in Salem. Yeah. They've got a beautiful courthouse down there. It's not mined there anymore. It's moved up here. Good. Thank you. But it's in the same belt. Salem, Salem, Indiana is in this belt. And it has the same fossils, same age, same sort of right. uh, general characteristics. And Uli, I, I was interviewed for a radio thing just Saturday. And uh, Oolites are really coated grain, sand that's rolled around in a warm sea, and limestone is deposited in rings or, or uh, shells around it. Okay, so it's actually and, a formation. And they thought oolite is also a term for fish eggs. So when people call it oolitic limestone, it, is, it mostly is uh, a foraminifera called endothyria bailei, but they mistook that for oolite. So Oolite should really be called endothyria bailey. <laughs> <laughs> Did you write that down? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> While we're on nomenclature, uh, before World War II, more stone was taken out of, of uh, Lawrence County, and after World War II, to this day, more stone is being taken out of Monroe County. But both counties have played a very important role. But this dominance that the Lawrence County and Bedford had before. World War II, uh, a, a lot of times a salesman would imply to customers around the country that Bedford stone was really superior right. to anything else in Indiana. It was. And the Bloomington <laughs> folk really got ticked at that, obviously, because it's all the same damn stone. But that's what we did. And it worked. Yeah. The yeah. hard quarry workers were better down there. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a, here's a little known, not we're, if, now that we're getting into the minutia, here's a little known fact. There is an executioner in England in the Middle Ages named Derek, and that's where we get the word for Derek's. He was hanging people. And the rig, the rig that he built was referred to as a Derek. It was named after him, and that's why we call those Derek's. Okay, here we go. 
this area has really been very instrumental in developing techniques, as you said. And now they have developed these, uh, they're like a chainsaw with a belt with diamond impregnated tungsten carbide. And they just saw through the stone very well, and they've now developed them so they don't just do down like this, but they also do sideways. Yeah. And it's really, H.R. Myers down in Bedford is one of the premier people, and uh, uh, some of the people down there developed these stone, to, and they go now underground. There's yeah. an underground limestone quarry. Yeah. yeah, the Myers belt saw is a major step up. Um, and, and if you watch them operate, it does. It just looks like a big electric chainsaw about nine feet long. Um, and, and those came out of the uh, marbling industry, which has been done under down for, un, underground for centuries. So a lot of the marbling is, a lot of marble is cut from underground mines. And when Elliot went, found out about how to do that, he started doing it with limestone in Bedford. Yeah, Elliot. Yeah. Elliot yeah. Any other questions? Fatality rates? I know there was an injury called a strawberry. Oh. <laughs> the fatality rates were huge. And, they're, and, they're, and, and in, in fairness to the industry, nobody really wants to say that. And I, I, you know, I think it's probably wrong-footed to say, oh, yeah, it's too dangerous to make it worth doing. But a, there were a lot of injuries. And if you go back through the news, uh, a lot of the mills published news weeklies, you know, and a lot of industry did, you know, for employees and so on. And they were just kind of business news and what was going on in the industry. And they shared how they marketed themselves and so on. But they often had a, a almost, not an obituary column, but a column of people who got injured. And they were, they were really tokens to their families of appreciation. And they weren't necessarily deaths, but there were a lot of injuries. And uh, Michael's grandfather? Lost a finger, did you? Yeah, I lost a finger. It didn't take, it's, you don't have to drop too big a piece of stone to lose a finger. But in those old newspapers I've studied from the 20s and 30s, to, uh, you know, there was something going on every few days since the yeah. Yeah. an injury or death or yeah. uh, some kind of crazy accident. In fact, if, one time we even counted the, I forget how many it was. Yeah, there, there, we had coroner's reports from 1885 to 1935. And it listed all the manner of death. There were a lot of queries. Well, you can see from the photographs how many different ways there were to, to get hurt. And that one showing the electric channelers, and there's water puddles on the floor of the quarry, and there's huge electric cables running up. There's an open transformer with no cover on it, and there's people just standing around, you know? We don't want to lose track that the, the railroads were injury and killing off employees. Yeah, it wasn't any industry where there wasn't a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But yes, yeah, it's, it's, and it's dangerous in those places today because those stones move around. And um, we, we notice in, in ours, in the winter particularly, you'll hear these crashes and big slabs come off the walls from freeze thaw. And in one of our quarries, a whole block came off, you know, and just fell into the water. So yeah, it's not a place you want to be climbing around. I mean, quarry owners rightly say, you know, they, they want people to stay out of there for safety. It's it's not, and I do tours, and you have to like keep people in line and make sure they don't. Oh, what's down there? <laughs> There's a lot of meandering. All right. Well, thanks very much. Enjoyed it. Thank you.